So we're going to look at how to use a regular perturbation method. Uh, of an initial value problem. And in this case, we're going to go back to the projectile problem that we started the, the, the semester with. And what I want you to recall is that what we basically do, the, the procedure here is that what we do is we assume a guess for the solution for x. So if you recall, the, the projectile problem has, this is the differential equation. We have x double dot, which is a function of time, is equal to negative 1 over 1 plus epsilon x squared. And then we have the initial conditions that x at 0 equals 0 and x dot at 0 equals 1. So a few notes on these equations. I'm using the non-dimensional equations that we derived two classes ago. There's a couple of uh, remarks or from students who are kind of trying to figure out different notations they can use to kind of keep things as close to the initial problem as possible. One of the things you'll find, which is uh, I think generally frowned upon, yet often what people do is they'll kind of do the change of variables, non-dimensionalize the equations, arrive at something with a, you know your small parameter epsilon in there, and then basically just switch all the letters back. And so you know we had something that was like u double dot equals one over one plus epsilon u, uh, and you kind of you know it's bad form, but you basically could think of it the other way, which is like, I know I would like to end up with x and t as my variables in the equation. So I'll just write my, my equation as something else, u double dot, um, and then kind of switch to what you want. So that's what I've done here. I basically have gotten our dimensionless form of our differential equation, but I've written in terms of the variables that we are comfortable with, x being the vertical height of the ball, and t being time, and epsilon being the small parameter that we uh, derived a little while back, which is the, I think, the ratio of velocity to, uh, no, sorry, the ratio of the height of the ball to the radius of Earth. Okay, so we're clearly looking for our goal here, just so we're clear. Our goal is to find an equation where x of t equals something. And we expect x of t to be some function of epsilon. I'm going to show you when we load up Mathematica that we can't simply solve this differential equation and arrive at x is some function of epsilon. If you ask Mathematica to do it, it's going to just spit out nothing, which is Mathematica's way of saying, I don't know how to solve this. And that's a good indication of which you say, okay, I know the differential equation I want to solve. I can't solve it analytically. In this particular case, solving it analytically means having an expression for the height of the ball for any um, epsilon that you choose to put in the equation. The next best thing we can do, and we'll do this with Mathematica as well, is we can numerically solve the equation for some particular value of epsilon. This is great because it gives us something to check our approximations with. It's also not general in the sense that we don't really know how the equation behaves for all epsilons. If we want to solve it for a different epsilon, we have to go back and do a numerical solution for another value of, of, of epsilon. And then we have to kind of like almost like interpolate what we think is happening as we change epsilon. Okay, so this is what we want. We have a set of differential equations. We have initial conditions. We would like to get uh, uh, x as a function of t. 
which is going to be some function of epsilon. I guess in time, I should be more clear here. This is a little, let me just, uh, so it's going to be a function of time and epsilon. Okay. So what we do is we make a guess. We say we know we want something that's going to be a function of time and epsilon. And so we make a guess. Okay. And that guess is typically in the form of a Taylor series expansion. And we did this before where we said, okay, well, we'll say that X of T is going to be something like X naught plus epsilon to the alpha times X one and so on and so forth. Remember that we kind of lumped together the free factor and the uh, derivative of x with respect to t inside these coefficients. So these things here x naught is a function of time, and uh, we, we, we kind of have just simplified our notation so that we can just kind of carry these things with subscripts here. We've also not assumed that we can uh, know the expansion of, of um, epsilon in terms of is it of integer order in which we would have epsilon to the zero, epsilon to the one, epsilon to the two, so on and so forth. We've left it at alpha and we'll go through and kind of see how we determine what epsilon's uh, power is as, as we go forth. Okay. It's not immediately clear. So this is our goal. We, we're going to take this guess and the idea is going to be that we're going to take this guess and truncate it at each order. So we're going to first start by truncating it at order one, which means we neglect epsilon entirely. And then we're going to solve, go back, put this equation back in up to epsilon to order epsilon alpha, find out what alpha is, go on and, uh, and solve. This is exactly like we did it for the set of polynomial equations. All right, to start, one thing I will say is that whenever you have something that is, uh, so anything that looks complicated, something in a square root, something in a uh, in your denominator where you have uh, higher order terms, remember that we are about to approximate our solution. So it's perfectly valid if we're going to be approximating our solution to approximate the, the form of the, the, the equation that we're trying to solve and make this a little bit simpler for us. So what do I mean by that? I mean, we can take this and expand the right hand side of this equation using a Taylor series expansion. Getting comfortable and like, doing this frequently with your equations is, is like a, a fantastic tool to kind of have with you when you're, when you're working on solving problems. Just trying to see like what happens at higher order if I, how much does this term matter? What happens if I get rid of it? If I know the magnitude of epsilon, maybe I can throw some terms out to make my life simpler, just to see if I can get a, uh, at least a cursory understanding of what's going on. And then maybe I can go back and try to do things um, uh, without having to truncate terms and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you don't recall how to do this, that's okay. I'll show you how to do this in Mathematica in a moment. But if you expand the right-hand side, what you end up with is that um, x double dot of t is equal to negative 1 plus 2 epsilon times x minus 3 epsilon squared x squared and so on. 
this is something in which we're, we, we're using a Taylor series expansion. We don't have, since we're not get, kind of guessing at anything here, we're just approximating it. Since we're not guessing, we don't need to leave the exponent unknown. We're actually saying, I'm going to use a Taylor series expansion to approximate this equation that I currently already have. Over here, I'm saying I'm going to make a guess in which what the, the form of my solution is going to look like, in which case we don't really know how epsilon is going to enter it. So that's why here we have kind of polynomial order and here we have some unknown order. Okay. Oops, I should be a little bit more careful. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. So there's our there's our approximated approximated equation that we're looking to solve. Okay. So using our guess, we can immediately write down what the ordinary differential equation becomes with our guess. So let's say this is our ODE. So what I mean by that is that it's now where we're going to take this and insert it, oops, insert it into here. Go back to our guess color. Okay. So that means that we would write on the left hand side becomes x double dot not, because this is the, the first term in our series, plus epsilon to the alpha of x1 double dot plus some higher order terms. And this is going to be equal to negative 1 plus 2 epsilon x naught I'm going to go slow here and just make sure everyone's on the same page because this is both A, crucial, and B, parts where people get a little bit confused and then later realize that they're quite confused. So everything is okay? Is, are people following so far? Take a second to jot down what you think the initial conditions are then. Hopefully you found the same initial conditions I did, which is that instead of it being x at 0 equals 0, it's going to be x not at 0 plus epsilon to the alpha, x1 at 0 is equal to 0, and so on and so forth. And then same for your uh, initial velocity condition, which is saying that the initial velocity, x not, 
dot x naught at zero plus epsilon alpha x one dot at zero and so on and so forth equals zero. Is everyone with me so far? Yes. All right. So now all we're doing is we're going to look at each order and solve for our unknowns. In this case, our unknowns are going to be the prefactors multiplying epsilon, and we'll have to interpret what the uh, exponents are going to be. So at order one, in which epsilon is completely neglected, we can identify that this term remains, this term remains, this one, and this one, this one, and this one. And so we're looking at a much simpler problem. We end up with x double dot is equal to negative one using the initial conditions at x naught, at zero, yeah. and initial velocity at zero, or uh, oops, equal to one. I want to remind you that this is the problem we solved on the first day of class. This is effect, This is equivalent to taking epsilon exactly equal to zero, taking the limit of epsilon as it goes to zero, but in this case, we're taking epsilon to zero. We end up with the reduced problem, which is the problem that you probably learned in a high school physics class of the height of a projectile as a function of time. And this is a problem that we can solve directly. How do we do it? We just simply integrate both sides so let's do that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm making maybe I wrote down wrong. So for the last one, the initial velocity. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I wrote down. One. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It should be one. Up one. Up. I just I wrote down okay. over here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Probably not dark enough. Okay, so this thing's pretty straightforward to solve. We integrate once, we get x naught dot t is equal to negative t plus c1. Our initial condition tells us that c1 has to equal 1. So as we plug in t is equal to 0, everything drops out, so we have c is equal to 1. Uh, then we have to integrate one more time. So that x naught of t is equal to negative 1 half t squared plus t plus c2. Oops. My t's and my pluses look the same. Let me try and fix that. plus c2. And since at time is equal to zero, uh, x naught is equal to zero, then we know that c2 has to be equal to zero. And put it all together, we get the solution to first order as x naught is equal to t I know I grouped it this way for some reason. T minus one half times T. This is non-dimensional, so it doesn't look exactly like the way we had um, written the form of the solution before. However, this is pretty clearly something that is uh, uh, to the power of t squared, and this uh, kind of these two terms kind of combating each other is going to give you this parabola, which makes sense. We're going to get something that's going to look like uh, 
something like that. I'll just remind you, because this looks like I'm throwing something from here to there. That's not the problem we're solving. It's the problem we're solving is throwing something up and then coming back down. Okay. This should be okay. Procedurally wise, this is straightforward, hopefully. Questions? Um, Professor, I do have one question. Yeah. Um, so earlier, like in that, where is it? That purple part, like where you uh, box the red things. Is the only reason why you picked out like just the first term on the left hand side and the first term on the right hand side because epsilon is small? You're just like. It actually has nothing to do with the magnitude of epsilon here. We are so, we are basically trying to solve this equation um, for uh, each order of epsilon to a power. And so if we if epsilon is not small, what that means is you need to keep more and more and more terms to get a good approximation. If epsilon is exactly zero, we should get the solution we got when we uh, we, knew, we threw it out on, on day one. So we're not saying anything about the size of epsilon here. What we're saying is we can approximate the solution. We can get at uh, we can get some solution that's going to look like this. If we just solve this complicated equation piece by piece, and by, and by that I mean we first solve it when we have no epsilons at all, and then we solve it when we only have epsilons to the first order. And the first order here, we don't know what that means because we don't know what alpha is. I'm about to show you that it's going to be one. And then we can go back and do the same thing and solve for uh, epsilon to a higher order. The process is, is recursive in the sense that in order to solve for what's happening at epsilon to the alpha power, you first need to know what's happening at epsilon to the zero power, and then you plug that back in. And then so on and so forth. So you kind of solve it at the first step, go forward, solve it on epsilon to the alpha step, take that solution, plug it back in, solve it at epsilon to the beta, and so it's, you end up with this kind of recursive solution. The more terms you keep, the larger epsilon can be for you to uh, approximate the particular problem you're interested in. You often know the problem you're interested in. Here, we're just solving this kind of arbitrarily to show you how to do it. Oftentimes, you kind of know, all right, epsilon's roughly about 0.4 for me. So I need to probably keep not zero terms, but maybe I need to keep two or three terms. And what you'll find out, even if you don't really um, have a solution to compare to, what you'll find out is that as you keep more and more terms, your solution doesn't change that much for your particular epsilon. As we'll see, and we can't see that here. We can see it more clearly when I start pulling things up in Mathematica and kind of plotting how these solutions look. But yeah, we're not assuming anything about epsilon here. All we're doing is saying, I'll just solve it when epsilon is exactly zero, and then I'll solve it when epsilon is only matters to order one, solve it when epsilon only matters to order two, and then just keep going. So is this first one that we did um, with O1, is that when epsilon is, ex is exactly zero? Like Correct. We're going okay. Because you can think of me as writing this approximation um, as, uh, I will do this quickly and then I'll probably erase it. You could th think of this as me saying x naught times epsilon to the zero plus epsilon x one times epsilon to the alpha. And we're going to find out that alpha is one. But this first term is always kind of like x naught times epsilon to the zero. Epsilon to the zero is one. It disappears in the problem. And what's, what's happening here is that we're actually taking the limit as epsilon goes exactly to zero. The reason this is a regular perturbation problem is because the number of solutions to our problem doesn't change when we take epsilon to exactly zero. Or let me say that another way. I have a second order ODE, which means I need two initial conditions. When I take epsilon to zero, 
I still have a second order ODE, and I still have two initial conditions. That's a, a regular perturbation problem. A singular perturbation problem, which we'll do next, is such that when I take epsilon to zero, the nature of my problem changes. So I might have started with a second order ODE, and then if I take epsilon to zero, it might change it to a first order ODE. And that's a problem. We have to figure out how to deal with that. But here, we're, you're right. The first order, we're taking epsilon to exactly zero, which corresponds to the reduced problem. Like this is the, the reduced problem that we've been talking about where we kind of, kind of throw away uh, something and solve it in the simplest way we can while still kind of, kind of retaining the nature of the, of the problem of a, of a projectile going up and down. I guess, so I'm a little confused because like if you take epsilon equal as it goes to zero, then like your original equation just becomes x of t equals one, like x double dot t equals one. So then you're like hugely simplifying that right part. So I guess I'm just a little confused at why we're doing that exactly. Yeah, it's because, okay, good question. So. Exactly. So what you just said is exactly right, and I just tried to highlight it here. Taking epsilon to, to zero changes the equation and turns it from something that's nonlinear to something that's linear. It's linear because there's no x squared terms appearing here at all. This will work and will be a good approximation to your problem if epsilon is exactly zero. So kind of each step along the way gives us a good approximation to a slightly bigger epsilon. And remember, epsilon here is, um, I'll write it out just for clarity. So let's see here, let's see if, how badly I can draw. No, this will be perfect. So there's the earth. Here's, oh gosh, here's my ball that I've thrown up, the tiny, tiny dot, and this is the radius of Earth, this is the height of the projectile from the surface of Earth, X and Epsilon, is the height of the projectile over R. Actually, what do we find epsilon to be? I remind myself. I don't want to get that wrong. I think it was the characteristic height, xc over R. I'm going to remind you what we have. I think it's, uh, oh yeah, which is v naught squared over g times R. So epsilon is basically the ratio of the initial velocity squared over gravity times the, times the radius of Earth. So what does that mean? It means that we're throwing a ball up and if we take epsilon to be exactly equal to zero, and we're saying that the nonlinearity that appears here due to this term, the nonlinearity appearing in the denominator has to do with the fact that when the projectile gets far from the center of Earth, gravity acts less and less to pull that, that projectile back down. We're saying that if we throw the ball like literally this far off Earth, like right in front of me, the gravitational field from here to here isn't changing notice uh, much at all. And so we can say the height of that, uh, my pen here is not going to vary uh, due to the change in the gravitational field. This is only gonna be valid to some small ratio of epsilon. It's gonna be something like epsilon less than say 0.1. And when epsilon gets larger than 0.1, we're going to need to account for that nonlinearity somehow. 
we'd like to be able to just solve the equation analytically and then fully account for it, but we don't know how to do that. And so what we do is we kind of add in that nonlinearity here. And we add it in at higher and higher orders, which allows us to approximate this solution for larger and larger epsilons, which depending on the nature of our problem that we're trying to solve, kind of we have to make a determination of, all right, when do I truncate the solution? Does that, does that help? We aren't throwing away a lot of terms, but we're saying that the terms we're throwing away are basically zero, which is true when epsilon is small and false when epsilon is not small. And so what we need to do is keep including more terms in our approximation to account for what the difference in what happens when epsilon gets, is, is larger. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, I have a question uh, for the about the Taylor series expansion. Um, so for um, x uh, for x of t, are we uh, are we using a Taylor series expansion there too, and then plugging that in into uh, the second derivative of x of t, or yes. So here is uh, you're talking about this term I'm circling in green. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, we are. So this is a Taylor series expansion. If you recall in our notes, hold on, let me pull those up really quickly. Um, here. So here's your typical Taylor series expansion that you're probably familiar with. This is written in terms of f of x. We're typically doing expansions in terms of x of epsilon. So we have something like x at 0 plus epsilon x prime at 0, and so on and so forth. So I've really just done some notational changes to turn to map x to epsilon and f to x. And then I said, this is true. This is your typical Taylor series expansion. Um, but a lot of problems, especially nonlinear problems, especially problems that involve uh, singular uh, perturbations in which epsilon is multiplying the highest order polynomial or the highest order derivative in your problem. In those cases, it's not necessarily fair to assume that we will have just a uh, uh, integer of orders in our expansion. We might have something like what actually we might find is that alpha is like one half. And so you end up with like epsilon to the one half, epsilon to the one, epsilon to the three halves, epsilon to the, uh, to the two, and so on and so forth. And so instead of guessing that it's an integer powered expansion, in this case it is an integer powered expansion, but we're, we're just not focusing on that at the moment. Instead of guessing, we just write it in this way where we do two things. One is we replace the integers with unknown variables that we will determine and we'll determine alpha in the next step. The second thing we did, and this was mainly for notational simplicity. I don't know if it actually helps or it allows us to not carry around uh, derivatives and uh, the prefactors is we just kind of lumped the derivatives and prefactors into like which order of epsilon x we're at. So this is x at order zero, x at order one, x at order two. And what we did in this, in these notes is showed down here that when we said x not x prime not, what that refers to is take the derivative of x with respect to the epsilon, that's what x prime means, and then evaluate it at epsilon is equal to zero. And what's that? So, so here's x where um, and what we find is that we end up with negative one and we said negative one is what we're going to call x one. And so the coefficients here are still exactly what you would expect from a, your series expansion. So one half x double pr prime not, uh, sorry, x double prime at zero. We just have kind of 
made our notation a little simpler. Because all we really care about is plugging in this equation. We want to know what x naught is, we want to know what alpha is, we want to know what x1 is, and then so on and so forth, to however many terms we need. Right, that makes sense, yeah. Okay. So before we can move on, we are going to look at, kind of by inspection, what is happening at uh, first order or the um, kind of the, uh, yeah, so we can say, what do I have? I have X not epsilon. And just by the same analysis that we had before, I have on the right hand side, oops, make sure you can see this. So on the left hand side, to order epsilon to the alpha, I have, um, on the left hand side I have epsilon to the alpha x double dot, and on the right hand side I have two epsilon x naught. You might be wondering why I didn't circle this term. Well, recall that this is going to be multiplied by epsilon, so it's going to actually be 2 times epsilon to the 1 plus alpha times x1. So this term is actually higher order. If I take this and multiply by that, I get 2 epsilon 1 plus alpha x1. So the only terms at, at kind of first order, uh, sorry, epsilon, yeah, order epsilon are going to be this one and this one. The only way these two terms can cancel each other out is if alpha is equal to one. We have to be able to add these things together. They're the only terms left in the equation. And so if epsilon is equal to uh, if these two terms have to be kind of uh, compatible, then alpha has to be equal to one. Okay. So we have two of the terms at the next order in epsilon, um, but the other ones we're going to need are what? We're going to need this term. And this term. This is probably one of the parts that confuses people the most, so I will make sure to go through it carefully. So now we're at order epsilon, or epsilon to the one, because we just figured out that alpha has to be equal to one. So take a minute and tell me what you think the three, write down what you think the three equations are here, the governing equation, and the two initial conditions. The tricky part of this is comes into the initial conditions. The first step is pretty straightforward. It's going to be that um, epsilon times x double dot one is going to equal two epsilon x naught. 
And if you'd like, you can cancel out your epsilons here. Okay, well, the second the initial condition below, no problem. X1 at zero has to equal zero. And here's the confusing part, but I want to make this clear. Looking over here, we have said that this term here to first order, when we looked at our first order solution, x naught dot evaluated at zero is equal to one. That means this term here has to be equal to zero. Because if this is equal to one, I'm going to add something to it, and I still need the result to be one. The only way that can work is if I'm adding zero to it. So everywhere along here, I'm going to be adding zeros. So the most common mistake people make when they're doing these regular perturbation methods is to is to write this initial condition incorrectly. Oops, I just wrote it incorrectly, there you go. Um, that initial velocity at this order should be equal to zero. We've, another way to think of this is, like we've already kind of used the initial condition. We used it here, that x naught at zero is equal to one. The fact that we've, we've used it and we're looking at this approximation if x naught at zero is equal to one, everything else has to be equal to zero. And so our initial conditions actually kind of change at that higher order. This is confusing and I think it'll probably continue to be confusing um, as you work through different problems, but I, I kind of want to point this out explicitly. We've already exactly said this. And so therefore the only way this equation can be true is if we are going to add zeros to it. How do people feel about that? I'm not going to solve this. Uh, initial value problem out by hand. Um, we'll do it on the computer in just a moment. But, I'll, but I'll, again, it's pretty straightforward. You have a, a simple uh, ODE, which can be integrated twice. We actually know what X naught is, so we don't have to leave it unknown, or you can, do, you can plug it in later or plug it in first, whatever you like. But if we kind of integrate twice and apply these boundary conditions, what we find is that x1 is equal to 1 12th, 1 12th times t cubed, 4 minus t. Yes. Okay. Let me go back to our guess. We guessed that the solution to our equation would be this. It would be, we know that it should be x of t is going to be a function of t and epsilon. We guessed that we could write epsilon of t, x of t to be equal to some expansion in the form of a, uh, a, a general series expansion in which we say, well, it'll be like x naught plus epsilon alpha x1 plus epsilon beta x2 plus epsilon gamma x3, so on and so forth. And so now we have the left-hand side is what we want, and the right-hand side contains something we know, usually epsilon, and three unknowns, x naught, alpha, and x1. But now we've done the hard work. And we can plug these things in. So now we have that x naught of t should be approximately equal to t times 1 minus 
one half t plus one twelfth epsilon. Oops, I was going to say epsilon. Epsilon t. What is that? T squared. T cubed. There we go. Or minus t. I'm just going to move this out of the way of circle earth. Plus higher order terms. This is the order one solution or order one approximation. This is the order epsilon approximation. A more formal way to write this. A more formal way to write this would be getting rid of these dots and saying plus terms that are of order epsilon squared and higher. So going back to Aluda's question about, well, why didn't we throw out a bunch of stuff here? What, why are we able to do this? What we're doing is we're kind of constructing our solution piecewise. And we can keep going to whatever order we need to, because at the next order, it's going to be like, okay, let's just, I have to write all this out a little bit better. I'm going to have something that's going to be like epsilon to the beta on the left-hand side. And I'm going to have something that's like two epsilon alpha, so that's two times epsilon to the one plus alpha, well alpha is one, so I'm going to have epsilon squared there, so I'm going to find out that in order for this to work, beta has to be two, and, and then we can go forth and solve that order epsilon squared, and we would get x2, and we just got beta, and we could add another term to this, and we would see how our kind of height profile, x of t, is changing. And, and importantly, you can kind of see how it's changing Kind of what happens as my number here enters the equation. I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, allowing us to account for the nonlinearity to the uh, to the magnitude that it's relevant based on the size of epsilon. So if epsilon is large, the nonlinearity is going to be large. And I'm going to need a lot of terms to uh, account for the fact that that nonlinearity is going to affect x of t. And so this is kind of where, for your particular problem, hopefully you know something about epsilon. And you can say, okay, I, I expect epsilon is about 0.2. And what you can do is you can kind of solve this out to, usually what people do is they solve it, and then they kind of plot their solution for their particular value of epsilon they might be interested in. And then they go out to one extra higher order term, and they plot it again, and they say, oh, my solution really didn't change that much. So I can just truncate it and leave off all that complicated math. I'll just save it to the one where uh, it made the biggest difference in, in the plot. Questions? Yep. Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, I mean, and maybe the point is to use Mathematica, but doing this by hand, you have to start with the lowest order, epsilon to the zero. To get your x naught or something, you plug in to solve for x one. Exactly. They're, so they're yep. linked together. They're linked. Yeah, exactly. It's all recursive. You're gonna. You need x one to solve for x two. You need x two to solve for x three, and so on and so forth. So, you, so with mathematical or not, if you're approximating this in this way, you need to start at first order and kind of sequentially add more and more higher order terms. Okay. Great. And the more terms you keep, the better your approximation will be. As for higher and higher values of epsilon. The, you know, for a small value of epsilon, you're going to get technically closer to the, like the, the true answer, but you're going to have really small, each term is going to be adding, you're going to have like the answer is two, and then you're going to be adding 0. 0.00001 to it. So you're like, okay, well, it's still basically two. And so, you know, you can go to higher order terms if you'd like to, but if epsilon is really small, you're kind of doing a lot of work to add a tiny decimal to a large number. If epsilon's large, it's actually going to have a pretty significant effect. 
Other questions? All right, take a couple minutes, load up Mathematica, and then we'll just do this problem again uh, using Mathematica, not just to kind of berate the mathematics a bit, but also just to kind of show you some of the techniques you can use in Mathematica. Also, visualizing stuff to me really helps, and hopefully will help to all of you. Uh, so we'll take a couple minutes, get Mathematica ready, and go from there. Okay. Just staring over here for a bit. Let me get this camera. So I want us to work through this. And so I would I would love it if you are um, typing as you go and 
and trying to um, do some or all of the same things I'm doing here. Some of what I'm doing is pretty basic and stuff that I want you to know. I'll try to emphasize the stuff that is important for you to know. And then I'll try to emphasize the stuff that I'm kind of doing in Mathematica, both to help us visualize the problem uh, and also kind of uh, illustrating how you can use more Mathematica in a more advanced way that you don't need to know right now, but the notebook might help you in the future. It's already on my website. You can download both of these. This one's kind of a simpler way to do it. And this one, it has a little bit more extra stuff in there that I think is kind of useful, but at the cost of it's a little bit confusing at times. So first things first, we're going to define our differential equation in the initial conditions. So what I like to do is uh, start here. I'm going to open up just a new blank notebook. I'm going to kill a kernel. This is like mathematical 101. If something's not working, go here and quit the kernel. Because for some reason, variables are carried over between notebooks. So if you define x in one notebook and you have another notebook open and you forgot that you left one open, you, x might already be defined. So if anything doesn't work, quit the kernel and run it again. It doesn't cost you anything and it's usually pretty quick to get stuff back up and running. So what I'm doing here is defining my equation. So saying I'm going to call it eq for my equation. I'm going to use the single equal sign to indicate that I'm going to assign whatever comes next to eq. There's different equal signs, just like in MATLAB. Different equal signs mean different things. I'll try to talk you through them. So I'm going to define my equation as x double, uh, double prime of t. Now I'm going to use two equal signs, because now this is a, just like MATLAB, this is like a inequality. I'm saying the, the term x double dot of t uh, is uh, should, has an equality with the term on the right hand side. So think of it as like assignment versus equality. Double equal sign, if you get a space, they're going to make them come together and look like one. There you go. And then here's my governing equation. I put negative, the slash with the question mark. Okay. Uh, what are we missing? We're missing, so you can use, uh, to multiply epsilon by x, you can use a space, multiply by x. But remember, x is a function of time. Function is the square brackets. So whenever x appears in your equation, whether it's x, x prime, x double prime, you always have to tell it that you're referring to x of t. What's kind of annoying is if you just write x in Mathematica's world, that that's just like a different variable because you didn't tell it to use x of t. And x of t is what we want here. And I'm going to square that. To square it, you can just. Um, Hit again control and then I think it's the caret symbol which is six for me and then that's squared. You can run this and it'll spit something out. I don't know why it's taking, oh it's taking out that quick with the kernel. Um, but it's just going to spit out what we told it and so if you want to suppress that you can put a semicolon there and it goes away. And now it's stored. If I type in eq I get it back. Okay. Uh, my initial condition, so I have two initial conditions. I use IC for initial conditions. So IC1, I'm going to define as x at time at t is equal to zero. That's how you would do that. Double prime, sorry, double equals zero. Again, it's just going to spit out x uh, at zero is equal to zero. So we can just suppress that. And IC2 is x prime at zero is equal to one. And again, it'll do the same thing. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is I want to convince you that figuring out how to approximate the solution to our equation is not a waste of time. So how do I do that? Well, I can say, well, let's try to solve this differential equation. So the way to solve a differential equation in Mathematica is you cite a capital D, capital S, so D solve. Uh, so that stands for differential equation solve, solver. And you have to put that in square brackets. And now it needs three arguments. It needs to know what are you trying to solve? 
So in our case, we're trying to solve an initial value problem. So I have to give it a list of equations. So to give it a list of equations, I put these curly braces here. Inside the curly braces, I give it all the equations I'm solving. My equation, my initial condition, and my second initial condition. So I'm saying, please solve this system of equations. And then you have to tell it, what are you solving it for? You're solving for x of t. That's, that's what I want. I want x of t. And then for some reason that I don't know the answer to, you also have to tell it that t is the independent variable. So you have to give it a comma, t. And we can run this. And it doesn't know what to do. It says it's got implicit solutions, which means you kind of have some equation that is asking for itself back to figure out what the solution is. So it doesn't know how to handle that. So it spits out an empty list, which means I don't have an answer for you. So at least based on the tools that Mathematica has at its disposal, which are far greater than the tools that I have at my disposal, it doesn't know how to solve this equation. So we don't have a general equation that we can write down that's going to be uh, x of t is equal to some stuff with epsilons in there. Are, how are people doing? Are people able to follow so far? Yes. Okay, so on the right hand side, this is the notebook. This is on my website. This is the one that says it's the fancier one. So I did this already. I'm going to open this up because I forget how to do them. ND solve. I think I remember, but maybe we'll see what it is. But ND. So we can learn something, however, by solving this equation numerically. So there's no harm, there's no shame in that. We are going to solve it numerically. The only downside is that we have to solve this equation for a specific value of epsilon. And we have to put some bounds on our, uh, on our independent variable for time. So we can't solve it for all time, we can't solve it for all epsilon. So to solve it numerically, we would write ND, so numerical differential solver, ND solve. And then I think it's the same notation. You give it the list of equations. I see one, I see two. And then I don't want to get this wrong, so let me just remind myself. Uh, okay. Yeah, all right, perfect. So I'll plot these for now. Okay, so I'm going to copy this. Just to show you what it does, and then we'll I'll show you how I use it. So here I'm giving a list of equations, but notice what I'm doing. I'm saying use the this is this is all one term. This is saying the first entry in my list of equations is my is the equation up here, except that I'd like you to replace epsilon with a value. I chose arbitrarily epsilon being 0.1. You can choose whatever value you want. If you want to match what I'm doing here, choose epsilon as the point one. To get this notation, what you would do is you write EQ, and then you write that same slash dot. That means uh, replace, I think, or replace two. And then you can tell it replace epsilon with, so this is the, I guess, hyphen, and then the right caret key, and if you hit space, it makes it a little arrow, point one. We can just do that right here and see what happens. And you see what happens, it stuck, it stuck point one in there for epsilon. So now we're actually giving, we're asking you to solve this equation. So epsilon's gone. Now it's just for a particular solution we're looking for. The initial conditions don't have epsilon in them, so we don't need to do anything special to them. We just send them the initial conditions as well. We tell it we're solving for x, but in this case, we're not solving for x for all time for the independent variable t. The numerical solver is going to be able to solve this equation for x over some domain. So we have to tell it what domain we want. Sometimes you know, and sometimes you don't know. Um, and so what you can do is kind of start and Kind of guess what this the bounds on this domain are if you don't have any idea. Um, we do. Sometimes the way you can get an idea is by, again, if you can identify what the reduced problem is, solve the reduced problem, hopefully analytically if you can. And then that'll give you an idea of the of the bounds that you're interested in. For this problem, I know that the bounds should be uh, time between zero and four. So 
Again, we're going to give it this as a list. So those are curly braces, T comma zero comma four. And it's going to spit out something kind of ugly that you're going to be like, what do I, I don't know what to do with that. It's going to give you this. Okay. Why does it give you that? Uh, it's got, it's basically saying, I found values for X for a particular time between times equal to zero and times equal to four. It's a list of values, and I'm going to interpolate between that list uh, with, with a curve. And this is just kind of a little tiny snapshot of what that curve looks like. And you might be thinking to yourself, that doesn't look right. I thought it'd be a parabola that just goes up and comes back down. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a second. What do I do with this? Great question. So what you do with this, I like to do is just solve this as, save this as my solution. We'll call my solution S. Um, now we have S. And we can, the first thing I almost always do is try to figure out if I can plot it. So I can go with plot. For reasons that I don't know if I can explain at the moment, you have to actually ask it to evaluate um, x of t, which is what this solution is. Uh, sorry, which is what this kind of function is trying to solve here for using this solution. So follow my notation. Don't worry if you don't understand this particular part of it. This is just kind of generically what you do when you're dealing with a numerical solution. So if you don't get this, we can talk about it offline, um, but I'll just tell you what to type right now and then you can, uh, and we'll go on. This will this will not matter too much. So I wanted to evaluate my function x of t using my solution. So slash dot s, uh, and let's see what happens. I want to plot it from t is from zero to like, what did I say, four? Yeah, okay. And while we're here, why don't we label the axes? So we can go axes label, and then we have to tell it what the axes are gonna be, and the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is x of t. So for the axes label, you give it a list. The first entry of the list is the x-axis, the second entry of the list is the y-axis, and the quotes tell it that like you're just you want it to write these letters. Okay. You're solving a problem of throwing a ball up in up in the air and coming back down. Uh, the mathematics doesn't really know that you're solving that particular problem. It just knows that you're solving this equation. So it doesn't know that there is a ground and that the solution below zero has no physical meaning to us because the ball went up and hit the ground. And so it just keeps solving it. It just keep, gives you values for it. This is what would happen if you like threw it up and then just like moved earth out of the way and like let it fall Or I guess maybe not. It's, well, anyway, uh, I guess if you threw it up over a really large hole, that's what it'd do. Um, anyway, we don't care about that. Um, what, what might be interesting for us to know is to figure out like, for instance, how long does the projectile stay up in the air depending on my choice for epsilon? So here it clearly stays up in the air for like two-ish seconds, right? We can actually figure that out exactly. And we can figure that out exactly by asking it to find when our solution crosses the x-axis. The way you do that is you're actually, you might not think of it this way, but you're actually finding the root between that equation and the, the horizontal plane, which is just zero. So you're trying to figure out when, when, what is the, the root when those two, two curves intersect, the curve of the parabola and the x is equal to zero. And so in Mathematica, to find the intersection point, you use what's called find the root. So you're finding the root of, again, it's the same thing as x of t slash dot s. And when you want to find the root to anything in Mathematica, anytime you're trying to numerically find, uh, 
find the intersection between curves, you use find root, but you also have to give Mathematica a guess because if you notice there's two points at which this curve intersects the x-axis. One's over here. We don't care about that. We know that. And one's over here. So we will say, okay, well, it looks like it's happening. I want to find the root for t. And I want it to be some the root that's near two. So I give it a guess of two. And let's see what happens. That looks pretty reasonable, right? 2.14. We thought it was going to be a little bit more than two. And so it says that the time that this projectile goes up in the air is about 2.14. Um, you notice that this is in a list. That's kind of annoying. We can get it out of a list by typing, give me the first entry to my list. So that is this notation, square bracket, square bracket, one, square bracket, square bracket. Got rid of the curly braces. Now I still have this annoying thing in Mathematica. This is called a rule. It says the rule is that X would be replaced with 2.14182. That's not useful to us. I just kind of want the number. So the way I get the number is I type, I'm going to say, replace T with whatever comes after this. So I use the same, that kind of replace notation that we've been using. Replace, replace this with the solution. Replace T with what's happening over here. And when you do that, the T goes away. So now you get what you want. You get a number. What's the number amount of time this ball goes up in the air before it comes back down? So we'll call that the maximum amount of time. I'll call it T max and save it. And so now if I put this kind of above my solution here. I can plot this more smartly and I can plot this between X is equal to zero to X is equal to T max. And I get the parabola that I wanted. I'm going to ask it to do a couple things here stylistically that are going to help us tell this graph apart from the other graphs that we're going to be solving for. So I'm going to ask it to plot this with a certain thickness and then I'm going to ask it to plot it with a certain aspect ratio. So you, there's a million things you can do here, um, but these are the only ones that matter for right now. So now I have a nice line with X and Y labels. So this is my numerical solution. So this is, this is, uh, the numerical solution to this problem. And there's a lot we can learn. We learned how long the ball went up in the air. We can do stuff like, for instance, I can say, okay, the ball stays up in the air for 2.14 seconds when epsilon is equal to one. What happens when, sorry, point 0.1? What happens when it's equal to point 0.3? Well, I get another thing out. I can again ask it to find the root. And it turns out that the ball stays up in the air longer. That makes sense. It goes up with an initial velocity that's higher. Epsilon is now point 0.3. Gravity stays the same. Radius of Earth stays the same. So my initial velocity went up. So epsilon went from 0.1 to 0.3. And the amount of time that the ball went up in the air is a little bit longer. So if I plot this now, it's slightly bigger. Questions so far? I know I'm throwing a lot of mathematical things in there. Nothing? No typos on your end? No? Yep, question here. Uh, I mean, this is sort of just a, how do you quickly delete cells? Like, you kinda... Yeah, you see on the right hand side, yeah. uh, so I'll type in some garbage, garbage. Uh, see on the right hand side, you see this thing? Yeah. You can just click that, okay. and then you type delete. The other way you can get access to that is, say I'm like down here and I type like multiple things, multiple things. I can like uh, just hit shift and hit the up arrow okay. and that'll highlight that box and I can hit delete that way as well or shift and down arrow since my cursor is now above it, shift it down, delete and now it's gone. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Other questions, simple questions are fine too because if you don't feel comfortable in this environment you're not going to use it that well and it's really really powerful and I want you to feel comfortable in it. So there are no questions. Uh, to simple or dumb and learning a new kind of programming environment. Can you add comments in Mathematica? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot, you can add all sorts of things. 
So I can say this is, I'm going to insert a new cell above it. I'll call it my title cell. Um, and we'll call this, uh, so this would be uh, projectiles. Projectiles, this is an extreme version. But then I can come in here and I can do something like I can add a cell that is a text cell, which it says like the plot this. Or I think what you're directly asking is how do I add a typical like inline comment for coding? Um, in that case, I know the shorthand on a Mac and the shorthand is command slash that has the question mark on it. So that's command slash and you and you get that. That's a little bit annoying. I didn't want to do that. Uh, I'll do that down over here. So I can hit command slash. Uh, And so if you just want to type out yourself, you would just type uh, uh, parentheses, asterisks, here is my comment, and then you end it with asterisk parentheses. And so that's an inline comment, but there's all sorts of other formatting things you can do. You can come in here and say, I want this to be a subsection, hello, and I prefer my subsections to be magenta. No, I have a magenta subsection. There's a million things you can do. You can even output the results of these things as an HTML file. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of ways you can decorate uh, these cells to make it more clear. And then the nice thing about it is that the section and subsection allows you to kind of collapse things. So if you look on the right hand side here, so I can kind of collapse things so that the notebook is not too overwhelming when you first open it up. And I can kind of collapse, like, oh, collapse the whole numerical solution. How do I do the approximate to each order, and so on and so forth. OK, thank you. Yep. So I keep talking about how this is a nonlinear problem. Uh, it, nonlinear problems are hard to solve. Why are they hard to solve? Um, here's a way to illustrate that. So what I'm going to do right now, this is not something I would deem essential. So you can follow along if you would like. I'm just going to do this so that we can um, uh, get a better intuition into the actual problem we're dealing with. So I'm going to use something. So clearly, I would have different solutions, different numerical solutions if I use different values of epsilon. So there's actually a way in Mathematica where you can parametrically solve your equations numerically and sweep a bunch of epsilon values. That's really useful for us because we are curious to see what's happening as we change epsilon. So this is not going to give us an analytical solution. It's just going to give us a list of different solutions like uh, x and t. Kind of picture this as like a column. Like here's what t is, here's what the height of the ball is. Another epsilon. Here's what t is, here's what height of the ball is. We can generate all those columns in one line of code by having it parametrically. So this is parametric ND solve. Uh, it actually uses ND solve value. I've looked into this. I cannot tell the difference between the two things. So I uh, can't explain it. But I know that parametric, this is what this is doing is trying to parametrically solve this equation uh, for a whole bunch of different epsilon values. So look in what's here. You'll notice that I'm doing a numerical solver, but I'm not telling it what epsilon is here. So that's gone. So it just says solve the equation, solve it for x, solve it over a huge range of time because we don't really know what the bounds are. We just know that time's going up the larger epsilon gets. And solve it for the parametric value as we sweep across epsilons. If we don't quiet this, it's going to give us a whole bunch of different crazy curves that you're going to be like, I don't know. Do it, and that's fine. I'll show you. We know that as we change epsilon, the ball stays up in the air higher and for longer and longer, right? So we also know that we can find out how long the ball stays up in the air by uh, solving using a find root to identify when the value of x is equal to. Uh, zero. So we'll do that here. Um, here's what I'm basing this on. So you can read what I've written here. Find root always 
needs a guess. So here's where we're kind of like using math, but also using a little bit of coding. I'm asking it to find the root of this equation. So I'm going to copy this over here. So I'm saying, first off, find root of what? I'm going to find root of what I, I save this as p fun. So parametric function p fun. Spell it uh, p fun at what? So you'll notice that I have a square bracket here. What is that square bracket for? Well, we just solved this parametric function for a whole range of epsilon. So I can call it. So I could say I'm going to call p fun for epsilon is equal to one. And I'm going to get some curve. Or I can call it when epsilon is equal to zero and I'll get a different curve. Or epsilon is equal to 0 0.57. I actually don't know if this is going to work with my yellow. I oh, know it works. Okay. Um, so what the value going inside of this is the value of epsilon. So what I'm asking you to do is I'm saying find the root for epsilon when epsilon is zero. And I'm going to find the root of this function p fun at epsilon zero, which is a, also a function of time. So at what time does it cross uh, the x-axis? And I'll again, I have to say use t. We'll give it a guess of like two, which is three. Um, and it turns out it's exactly two. So when epsilon is equal to zero thing crosses here. So you don't have to follow along too much here because I'm going to, I want to just show you what we can do here. So again, I'll do the same thing. I'll ask for the first item in the list. I'll replace T with that. So I get two and I'll call this like the ground. And all I'm doing here, I'm not going to even explain it. I'll explain it. Uh, if anyone wants, we can meet on Zoom and chat about it. What I'm asking you to do is basically as I increase epsilon, use the last ground and use that as your guess, and then figure out how high the ball is, how long the ball is in the air. Uh, trust me, don't worry if you don't know why I'm doing this. I think it'll be interesting to see what's happening. So this is just a way of generating a bunch of different solutions. And we can plot those solutions. And I'll explain this in a second. Okay, so if we plot these solutions, here's what we find. And this is why this problem is hard. So what's happening here? The, I'll show you the x-axis is. So again, don't worry about generating this code if you're confused. It's not important. I just want to be able to show you something so we can talk about it. So the x-axis here is, what is the x-axis here? Epsilon, right? Uh, epsilon and the y-axis here is t max. And I forgot to close it, so it yells at me. There we go. So look what happens. This is the reason I went through this is not to show you the Mathematica kind of craziness that happens to get there, but it's to show you why this problem is hard. As, as epsilon is small, the ball goes up and comes back down in two seconds. As epsilon goes up, it slowly increases and then really rapidly increases. And here's the nonlinearity coming in. It's basically saying as epsilon gets faster and faster, uh, sorry, as the initial velocity gets faster and faster, epsilon gets larger and larger, such that the, the amount of time that that ball is sitting up in the air before it comes back down goes up incredibly to large and large values. And then to the point where everything blows up. So look over here, it plotted. But this isn't actually helpful. Look in the data here. At 1.8, it's like 51 seconds. And 1.9, it gives you a negative value. What's happened? Anyone guess? Yep, it means they're horizontal or, or vertical asymptotes or something like that. Vertical asymptotes. Think about the physics. So go for the what's happening physically in this problem.
does it have something to do with how the estimation is considering it? Nope. It's, it's, this actually is not really an estimation here. We haven't done any estimations. Oh, does it never come back down? It never comes back down. Yeah. You've less, you've chosen an initial velocity that's larger than Earth's escape velocity. So the reason why this problem is hard is that there are certain values of epsilon where the ball never comes back down because you throw it fast enough, it leaves Earth's gravitational field and then just who knows what happens. The model doesn't work anymore at that point. So this is what, why this problem is hard. It's nonlinear and that nonlinearity actually has a physical consequence. And that physical consequence is that as the ball gets higher, gravity matters less and less to the point where gravity doesn't affect it at all. And then how, what are you actually even solving for? You're solving for the trajectory of this thing that eventually has no, uh, doesn't feel Earth's gravity at all. It's an entirely different problem. So I just wanted to show you this to give you a sense of kind of why these nonlinear problems are hard, like physically interpreting and understanding why they're hard. And now we can go and try to kind of solve this thing the same way we did by pen and paper. Um, but but doing it uh, in Mathematica here. And it turns out that as we solve this problem to higher and higher orders of epsilon, we can predict something like this. We can predict the amount of time the ball will be in the air. And we'll see that it works pretty well for small epsilons and then works slightly better and so on and so forth. All right. So there's a couple ways to do this. And I tried to, I tried to do it in the way that matches our notes the best, which is nice for that, but also makes the Mathematica a little trickier. So you don't have to do it this way. It's not the only way to do it. There's easier ways in Mathematica to do this. I kind of wanted to just match the Mathematica to the notes. And I that might regret that in a few minutes. So we'll find out. Um, so, okay. We need to basically be able to generate uh, a series expansion for X for any order of epsilon that we're interested in. So I wrote a function, I called that function expansion and it takes in the order. So what order are you interested in? And here's what this expansion does. So I'll show you. So this function is pretty easy to come up with on your own. So a Taylor series is you just write series and you tell it, what are you taking the series of? You're taking the series of X of epsilon uh, and I would like to give me a series between epsilon and uh, let's pick a number here. Let's say four. And so that looks familiar, right? That's a Taylor series expansion. We did the expansion about zero, which gives you a Maclaurin series. And we took it to fourth order. And so you can see here, zeroth order and a first order second order, third order, fourth order. And then it gives you this annoying thing that tells you there's also going to be solutions to fifth order. I just didn't write them down. And so that's helpful to know, but it's not helpful to do math with. So what we can do is we can say, please make this into a normal looking equation by using the function normal. And that just got rid of the uh, plus higher order term. Now, what I did here is I took this and I, oops, I just used it here. And the only thing I changed is I just made this my variable, n. And so, and I define this as a function. This particular equal sign says store this as this, but don't try to run it yet. Don't run it until I tell you to. The reason why you have to use that is because it doesn't know how to run this function because you didn't tell it what n is. And so how does it generate? It'll just try to like generate an infinite series and it's going to yell at you. So you use this colon equals to say, hey, store this thing as this thing, but don't, don't evaluate it yet. So I can type in expansion four and I get the same thing I did above. I can type in expansion 12 and I get some horrible thing. Expansion two and so on and so forth. So here's where I tried to make the notation match our notation in our notebook, which is going to make things look awful. So 
I tried to make a slightly more general expansion. And here's what I did. I'll show you. I wanted to use those coefficients here. So I said, let's do a summation of x naught or x of n of t times epsilon to the n. So again, we'll do to the fourth. And that starts to look a little bit closer to what we were doing in our notes, right? So I can go to the second, third, and so on and so forth. And so all I did was I changed this number to some variable, nn. And I said, let's call this expansion general. And let's just store this, but don't run it yet. Oh, I have to tell it to expect that it's going to look for nn on the other side of the equation. And so now I can write an expansion general to the three. And I can tell it to the Sorry, what was that? Is that the subscript? Oh, how do I get the subscript? Yeah. X uh, control hyphen uh, on a Mac, on a PC. I think it's still control hyphen on a PC, and that gives you that. Did that work for you? Yeah, I think. Mathematica is a well, you can read what I wrote here. Mathematica is really annoying about handling like, subscripts. And so you have to do this one thing, these, these two lines uh, to get it to handle them properly. This is caret, caret notation, uh, apostrophe, the one that's near the number one. And then you're telling it to make this into a symbol. I really wish I didn't have to do this. This is why I said this gets complicated. And this is why I'm already regretting this decision. But we'll just try our best to see if this works. So you run that, it pops up something weird in your screen, and you run this, and basically nothing should happen, but it's gonna not um, it's gonna treat this as a as a as a variable. So you can just kind of run it and just trust me on that. All right. So I'm going to rewrite our initial equations just so I'm separating kind of like what the exact things are and then what the approximate things are going to be. So I call these EQ A for approximate and then initial conditions, approximate, and so on and so forth. So let me walk you through this notation. So this looks already a little bit confusing. What happened? I thought we had an equality there. All I did was I moved the right hand side to the left hand side. And that will allow me in the future to write stuff like EQ A X of T is equal to zero. And that'll be the exact same thing as this. I just moved this term to the right hand side, to the left hand side of the equation. Um, what is all this garbage notation? So this is saying that I'm going to create a function called EQ A. And that function is going to be a function of X. And x is a function of t. My initial conditions are a function of x, which are a function of t. Again, don't worry about like thinking I wouldn't have done this on my own. But right now, we're going to solve this. And then you can kind of play with the code and see what makes sense and what doesn't. And like I said, this is not the only way to do it. That's why I saved two notebooks in our uh, on our website. You can download the other one, too, which is a little bit more like what I would do as a first step. And then this one's a little bit overcomplicating something that's kind of simple. All right, so let's look at the order one solution. And to get the order one solution, the nice thing is once we define all these, so I have to hit shift enter to run them all. I can say, let's call my function. And I want to look at the expansion in the general form when I take this out to zeroth order. And here's what that looks like. At zeroth order, it means take just the first term. That's going to be x naught. And, uh, and um, get rid of anything of, of higher order. 
So I'm also going to do the same for our initial conditions. I'm going to call the expansion. So now I've almost got my equation, but I still have an epsilon in here because I haven't actually uh, truncated this series to treat epsilon at uh, order zero. It just basically substituted in my guess for x for all my x's. So all we've done here is say, take my guess for x, which is here. I'm going to put in zero here and replace x in my equation with this. And so that's why I have x not here. But I still have epsilon. So what I need to do is I need to again take this thing, do is a series, do a series expansion, and truncate that series expansion at uh, order one, which in which mathematics I was counting at zero here. So it's going to be look like this series. Uh, this garbage that I just wrote. I'm going to copy it and. Do the series expansion for the variable epsilon around zero to zeroth order. What do I get? Oh, I forgot to do normal. And remember, I just wrote this side of the equation. I forgot to write or didn't, I left out the fact that this side is equal to zero now because I moved this thing to the left hand side. So in reality, this thing should be equal to zero. And if you check your notes, what happens? Does this work? I think it does. Yeah. Sorry, I was really slow right there. If you check your notes, what we wrote down in class a few minutes ago was that x naught double prime of t was equal to negative one. And I'll do and I'll call this my equation one. I'm gonna just do one, just do this for the initial conditions so you can see how it looks, and then I'll end the lecture there because I know we're running out of time. So the initial conditions work the exact same way. You call that variable thing we wrote up here. You insert x, our guess for x in, and you say that that's going to be equal to zero for the first initial condition, and it's equal to one for the velocity initial condition. And then we have our system of equations, and we can solve it. I'll show you this real fast. Uh, this is D solve my list of equations for X naught of T for T. And it looks sort of similar to what we have in class. So the, it factors the equation a little bit differently, but it's a parabola. And then finally, I will plot this, these two, so you can see what's happening here. And then we'll end. Oh no, I never named this. We're going to call this my numerical plot, so I'll call it num plot. this again. And so look what happens. So at order epsilon, it does pretty well for small times and then does pretty poorly as time goes up. Remember, we chose an epsilon of uh, 0.3 here. So this is a pretty large value of epsilon. Our approximation does okay, but it's clearly not good enough. So we clearly need to go to higher order. And we'll pick up where this thing left off next week to kind of finish this problem. I threw a lot at you with Mathematica. Uh, please play with it. The only way you'll get comfortable with this is if you kind of play with this and make mistakes and then email me or send me your Mathematica files if you're having trouble and I can help troubleshoot. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So you can kind of see our goal was to get this blue line. When we did the first order approximation, we did okay, but we can do better. And so we'll keep going and work on this uh, next class. All right. Thanks, everyone.